On? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. <clears throat> good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening for everybody dialing around the world. Uh, welcome to our guests in Saskatoon in person. Uh, for those of you dialing from online, uh, I'd just like to let you know we have snow in Saskatoon and it feels like Christmas with the way that I see the snow now. So I'm not sure you envy us or not. So with that, um, I'd like to kick off the, the fermentation series of our fermentation ecosystem development project. This will be the first uh, fermentation webinar of a series of uh, uh, presentations and webinars around the year. Uh, the next one will be around in June, which will be an industry session. And there will be another one in September. Please follow our social media and our uh, media announcements. We'd like to have you in other events as well. With that, I'd like to start uh, today's uh, program. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank all our partners, uh, Protein Industries Canada, uh, AgWest Bio, Global Agri-Food Ag uh, Advancement Program, University of Saskatchewan, College of Agri-Sources and Agriculture and Bioresources, and Saskatchewan Food Center. Uh, my name is Mamet Tulbik. I'm the president of the Saskatchewan Food Center, and uh, it's my pleasure to talk about the overall program today. So in the program, we'll start with um, uh, our keynote speakers. And after the keynote speakers, we'll have a short break, uh, just a couple of minutes, and then we'll move forward on the second part of the webinar, when we'll talk about uh, the partnerships and how we develop the overall ecosystem here, and then move forward in the program. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Lisa Speck. Dr. Lisa Speck oversees the Good Food Institute's uh, Science and Technology Department to build a roadmap for accelerating the alternative protein research while empowering the scientists to execute on this vision. And Dr. Speck's areas of expertise include plant-based meat, fermentation, technical analysis, forecasting and modeling, synthetic biology, and public speaking. Uh, so with that, we'd like to start with Dr. Speck's presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mehmet. Uh, it's great to be with all of you virtually. I'm dialing in from California. Um, no snow on the ground here, but that sounds lovely. Um, so great to be with you all. I am delighted to kick us off talking about the, the growing role and emerging role of fermentation in what, what I think folks in the audience probably recognize as one of the fastest growing sectors of the food industry, which is the alternative protein sector. And fermentation has a big role to play in what's happening in this space. Um, I'll briefly just introduce the, my institute. The Good Food Institute is a nonprofit organization, so donor supported, that serves to accelerate and advance the alternative protein sector 
uh, by, by landscaping technology needs and scientific opportunities, connecting folks across the industry ecosystem from entrepreneurs to established food and even meat and, and retailer uh, corporations and advocating for a level playing field for alternative proteins uh, through legislative actions and ensuring research funding um, and, and uh, fair labeling policies for this space. Um, we are mostly a US-based organization, but we do have satellite offices in several regions around the world and recognize that alternative proteins are uh, a leading sustainability solution for all types of, of economies and markets across the globe. When we use this term alternative proteins, there's really three main categories that fit into this. So these are plant-based which um, plant-based products, which incorporate most of the products that consumers are familiar with on shelves, things like plant-based burgers, plant-based cheeses, milks, et cetera. Um, and here we're really talking about products that are serving this sort of drop in direct displacement for products that would conventionally be derived from animal agriculture, so meat, eggs, and dairy. Then on the far right here, there's the cultivated meat sector, which is not on market yet, but is an emerging area um, with, with almost 100 companies uh, now working in the cultivated meat space to develop essentially um, identical products to existing animal meat products, but produced through animal cell culture. So cultivating animal muscle cells, animal fat cells, uh, connective tissue components uh, like fibroblasts, and assembling those into spatial arrangements and structures that um, are direct stand-ins for uh, meat produced through animal rearing and slaughter. And then in the middle, we have this category that's uh, a, a bit of a crossover across all three of these, but can also serve as a standalone, and that's fermentation, which is the use of microbial organisms, um, which could range from everything from microalgae to bacteria and fungi, uh, either as a primary source of protein and biomass to go into end products, or as an enabling tool for both the plant-based sector and the cultivated sector. And I'll touch on a few specific opportunity areas where fermentation is being applied in this way within this sector. As I noted, fermentation really spans um, everything that's happening in the alternative protein space. Uh, you can think about products in this space existing really kind of on a spectrum. They're, they don't fit neatly into any of, of those three categories, but rather leverage ingredients and enabling technologies from across every bucket. So um, if you think about even all the way on what we would consider fully plant-based and, and not even necessarily a meat alternative, something like tofu, uh, there's a role for fermentation produced enzymes to support say the coagulation process or protein functionalization. Uh, likewise, fermentation derived ingredients are used in plant-based meat products like the heme protein in Impossible Burger. They can be also used to cultivate uh, say fat for introduction into plant-based or cultivated meat products. Uh, fermentation is used to produce some of the media components such as growth factors and other signaling molecules for cultivated meat that will be really essential for allowing those products to achieve uh, ultimate price parity with conventional meat products. And then there are, are some products that are 100% fermentation derived. So for example, some of the recombinant protein products like gelatin or specific milk proteins or egg white proteins are uh, fully derived from, from cultivating microbial cells through fermentation. So you can see the footprint of fermentation sort of all across the alternative protein sector. Now within fermentation, there's sort of three lenses to think about the, the role that fermentation is playing here. The first is what I'll call traditional fermentation. So this is most akin to sort of historical uses of fermentation, um, which is essentially using intact live microorganisms uh, to modulate specific ingredients or to, to transform certain ingredients uh, into other forms that may be more highly nutritious, may have additional flavor profiles, may impact the texture or the food science functional properties of those ingredients. Um, so, you know, an obvious example in this case might be something like tempeh, where you're fermenting soybeans and creating a, a kind of wholly different end product than just raw soybeans there. But there are also companies 
using fermentation to functionalize, say, plant-based proteins. For example, that, that Ozo brand um, uses shiitake mycelium fermentation uh, to improve the properties of uh, rice protein and pea protein mix. So breaking down some of the off flavors, improving solubility, et cetera. The second category here is biomass fermentation. So this is where harvesting that, that uh, whole cell biomass is essentially the end product that we're going for here. So the most um, kind of classic company in this space is of course corn, which has been around on shelves since the 80s, starting in, in the UK and now really all around the world. But there's been an explosion of new innovation in the biomass fermentation category. Uh, for example, Meaty Foods out of Colorado is, is using filamentous fungi to produce these, these sort of in situ structured striated products that look very much like steak strips or, or chicken breast. Um, there's a company called Nature's Find um, that actually started from extremophile uh, research on microorganisms that lived in uh, Yellowstone's hot springs. Um, and identified a strain that was, was uh, food safe and also had really appealing growth properties um, in terms of decreasing some of the capital costs associated with large scale fermentation infrastructure, um, which is a, a point we'll come back to towards the end here of just how important infrastructure and facility access will be for this sector. Uh, and then precision fermentation is um, sort of building upon a classic use of fermentation for the last several decades of viewing these microbial cells as little host production factories for specific functional ingredients that are typically then purified away from the cells uh, and added to other food products. So I mentioned gelatin as one example. Geltor is just one of a handful of companies that are making recombinant or precision collagen. Um, Impossible Foods, I mentioned the heme protein. Every and Perfect Day are good examples of companies making egg proteins and dairy proteins respectively. And there's a whole host of startups working in that space and moving pretty quickly towards scaling and, and product launches. And there are really innovation opportunities all across the value chain here. So all the way from very far upstream, looking at kind of the basic inputs to fermentation systems, uh, both the cells themselves in, in any um, engineering or modification of those cells or even adaptation of those cells to make them more amenable to certain production environments or, or to increase yield or tolerance, um, as well as modifications and optimization to the feedstock, uh, which again is one of these areas that can really go a long way towards cost reduction in this sector, which will be really important. There's also room for innovation in the bioprocess design. Um, so looking at, at opportunities in this space as um, not kind of just strictly limited to the ways in which we've used fermentation before, um, but looking at whole new bioreactor designs that allow for higher productivity or lower cost or um, greater sort of operational ease, um, you know, allowing longer periods of, of continuous fermentation, for instance, or continuous harvesting rather than batch processes uh, will really be important for increased adoption and again, cost reduction of these products. And then at the end stage, um, after harvesting, uh, looking at ways to, to structure that whole biomass to improve, say, the texture of some of these biomass fermentation products, uh, or looking at new methods for purifying or refining specific functional ingredients that are being made through, through precision fermentation. Now, I'd like to give uh, a few examples of particularly high value opportunity areas that we see across alternative proteins, where it feels like fermentation can really play a role in overcoming some of the challenges, uh, especially challenges that are already facing the plant-based meat space, since that is sort of the most mature of these alternative protein platforms, and one that's experienced really tremendous growth in recent years. The first of those opportunities is uh, deriving new sources of fats that behave like animal fats from fermentation. Um, so if, if you kind of forecast out some of these growth projections that, that uh, market analysts are performing on what they think the plant-based meat industry will look like in say five years or 10 years, if you kind of do out the math for that volume of, of product, 
and then look at the fat um, components of, of these plant-based meat products uh, and look at that relative to sort of global production levels of things like coconut oil, for instance, as a classic saturated plant-derived fat, it becomes very clear that in, in relatively short order here, we're going to need new sources of fats that are saturated fats or that behave like saturated fats to really mimic that function that, that fat is playing in animal products and meat products. Um, so being able to use engineered microbes or just adapted um, kind of naturally high fat producing microbes uh, to produce these fat profiles will be really important. And there are a number of, of startup companies that have popped up just over the last one to two years to really capitalize on this opportunity. Um, there are, of course, also some other methods around, you know, structuring and encapsulating fat or cross-linking fats um, to improve some of those properties uh, without necessarily requiring fermentation. But this feels like a really high impact opportunity area to lean into where we know this demand will be materializing in just the next few years. Broadening out to other functional ingredients, there's, uh, as I mentioned before, kind of a whole suite of specific high value ingredients that the, the plant-based meat and kind of the whole alternative protein sector will be demanding in the coming years, and in fact already is. Um, so things like, again, pigments, flavorings, emulsifiers and stabilizers, so things to improve the functionality of some of these plant pr proteins where they might fall short. Um, uh, are huge opportunities to screen um, all of the biological diversity that exists across the microbial kingdom and look for, for proteins or other secondary metabolites that can perform those functions um, that either naturally are, are produced by certain classes of microbes or for which we can identify a biosynthetic pathway and import that pathway into classical production host strains um, to produce these specific high value ingredients um, at relatively low cost. So a lot of, of opportunities here and companies that are, are kind of leaning into a couple of different approaches. Um, one is, is sort of just screening for that functionality and screening for good candidates for these ing ingredients from existing sequence repositories. The other approach is more of a kind of design and engineering approach to really understand um, at a biochemical level how these ingredients are able to perform desired functions and then being able to design uh, proteins or, or other um, microbially uh, producible molecules that can perform those functions in alternative protein products. And I'll just elaborate a little bit on this enzymes category because this is a big one and I think, again, kind of leans into um, fermentation's ability to really support what's happening in the plant-based sector as well. Um, as, as folks here, I'm sure are familiar, there are a lot of challenges still with using plant proteins, things like relatively low solubility, challenges around gelling and cross-linking, which is particularly important for some of these structured plant-based meat products, um, undesirable flavors, so bitterness, beaniness, other off flavors, and some of these other functional properties like emulsification or ability to bind fat and water and give um, that really kind of juicy, satisfying um, sensory experience that consumers expect with meat products. So there's a huge opportunity here to use enzymes um, to address really all of these challenges with plant proteins uh, and therefore be able to, to valorize uh, plant proteins from, um, from existing supply chains and potentially to lean into novel crops uh, for meeting this need for, for plant proteins and alternative proteins. Another note I'll mention on that front, again, kind of coming back to this, this big picture view of all of these, these contributors to what's happening in uh, growth of alternative proteins, um, is that there's a huge uh, opportunity here to be smart about the way that we're thinking about feedstocks and crop usage um, as inputs to all of these platforms, plant-based, fermentation, and even for cultivated meat as that sector continues to expand. So, if you think of any traditional crop stream where you're harvesting that biomass, uh, milling it or grinding it down into say a flour, you've got multiple functional fractions or components within that biomass 
that, that serve high value uses across each of these different alternative protein categories. So processing of that, um, that, that crop agricultural material can be done in a smart way to really derive the most value out of every stream there, uh, rather than having this sort of primary product and lower value waste product or side stream um, paradigm to think about all of these as high value co-products. So for example, some of the larger uh, proteins, high molecular weight proteins tend to work really well in some of these plant-based products, uh, whereas uh, some of the smaller peptides or, or hydrolyzed fractions or even individual amino acids are in really high demand for cultivated meat and more so as that industry scales. But then you've got a, a pretty large fraction here that is um, these simple sugars, fibers, starches uh, that are, are, you know, potentially useful for um, major kind of caloric input to microbial fermentation platforms, uh, which again can be used across all three of these alternative protein application areas. Now, a major point for all of this um, to circle back to the need for infrastructure that I hinted at before is that for all of these solutions, we need to be able to tap into scale and we need to be able to tap into scale fast. So here's just a number of different estimates from different firms or industry leaders in the space of what percentage of the global meat market uh, they think alternative meats may be able to satisfy um, looking out through to, to 2040 um, and a few different sort of scenarios of, of low, medium, high estimates and so forth. And you can see that all of these entail a really substantial jump from where we're at today, which is somewhere in the 1% ballpark. We're at about, about 1.3 to 1.5% um, of meat in the US is, is currently alternative meats and slightly lower globally. So you can see in all of these cases, we've got a really rapid ramp up, which has big implications across supply chain and across all of our manufacturing capacity and processing capacity for these inputs and end products. And in the fermentation space, this crunch is particularly acute. So right now there are a lot of startup companies that are in this sort of upstream um, strain development, target identification, you know, metabolic engineering, process optimization type of phase uh, and relatively few players who are really ready to kind of step in and serve as that large scale uh, fermentation capacity provider or, or scale up provider. And um, there have been a number of notable partnerships with major companies, um, including companies like AB InBev and Unilever and Cargill that are serving as that, uh, that joint venture or commercial scale up partner. Uh, but those facilities are really in demand um, across the sector. And that crunch, as I said, will only get more acute um, and more severe as more companies kind of uh, refine their, their products and their processes and are ready to move into true commercial scale production. So there really is a strong need for us to increase uh, capacity really at every scale along this process. So pilot scale facilities that can service food grade types of applications rather than just pharma grade or biomedical applications of fermentation are in really short supply. Uh, and that holds true even at the demo and large scale uh, capacities. Um, I've taken a few numbers here from an analysis from Warner Advisors, uh, just looking at how many facilities are out there that exist. Um, as you can see here, the vast majority of them were not made with food applications in mind. So in some cases, these facilities are sort of over-engineered from a, a safety and certification perspective and therefore can add costs uh, once companies are looking at moving into them. Um, a lot of them were built a few decades ago, and so they're, you know, kind of getting to the end of their, their intended lifespan. Uh, so some of this capacity will actually be coming offline in the coming years. Um, and so you can see there's, there's just a really strong crunch, crunch that's expected here. Um, Mark Warner estimates that uh, the, this existing capacity can be fully accounted for in probably less than the next year or so, a uh, couple of years or so. So I'll, I'll just end um, to kind of, you know, applaud what Saskatchewan is doing of being forward looking about, um, you know, how, how uh, regions can position themselves as leaders um, 
in in the fermentation space um, and and really kind of lead on a couple of fronts. One would be in that infrastructure and capacity uh, realm, but also on the R and D realm. Um, so I've highlighted just a couple of calls from uh, folks like the Breakthrough Institute, as well as World Economic Forum, who are really calling for a more active role for governments, universities, nonprofit sector uh, to be supporting the sort of fundamental knowledge generation, as well as capacity building that will be needed for the fermentation sector to be able to grow at the pace that uh, that alternative proteins will will demand for it to fill all of these enabling roles uh, across the industry. So with that, um, I will close out and I'm happy to take uh, a few questions in my last few minutes here. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, we very much appreciate your presentation and participation. Uh, we have some questions from the audience, I believe, and we may have some questions here on the, on the online as well. Uh, with that, Amy, uh, no questions from the audience now. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from the audience in Saskatoon? So funding for these commercial scale productions, where does that look to be coming from? Is it primary government or are commercial industries actually interested in taking things to a large scale and fermentation process? A great question. Um, so most of what we've seen so far has been from industry. Um, so I mentioned a couple of, of those partnerships, Cargill, AB InBev, um, et cetera, who, who have large scale fermentation capacity and typically are uh, also in sort of agricultural commodities processing. So those fermentation facilities are often co-located on site um, with things like, you know, grain milling or corn milling. Um, so they're, they're sort of natural partners for that type of infrastructure. Um, but I think there's tremendous opportunity for public incentives, um, you know, uh, tax incentives or kind of economic development incentives, um, government backed loans, you know, all sorts of mechanisms that can uh, allow industry to, to lean more heavily into building this type of infrastructure in advance of this, this demand crunch becoming really, really severe. So being kind of able to be proactive and, and build out capacity before we're, we're in a spot where we're really squeezed. We have a quick question here um, from the Q&A. The first one is, what regions of the world are leading in ecosystem, ecosystem planning and development of this space? Yeah, so I would say um, for fermentation in particular, um, Europe is, is pretty strong, pretty strong contender there. Um, they, they have a lot of sort of longstanding fermentation expertise, a lot of that coming from um, sort of classic food and industrial enzymes production, as well as in the biomedical and biopharma realm. Um, so I think that that region has some nice models for collaborative partnerships that are public and private. Um, but uh, you know, that there's, there's again, capacity limitations there as well. Um, so a, a lot of fermentation capacity also in Asia, um, although I, I don't have quite as much insight there into sort of public role in, in that sort of ecosystem building activity. My sense is that that's mostly on the, the kind of pure commercial partnership side of things. Can I, if you can read the Test. question? Oh, there we got it now. One more question from online there. Um, th there are many companies approaching and more to come. Would you rather inject into the existing companies or create a new competition, um, new competition in the market? It's a really good question. I see value in both. Um, I think, you know, the, the instances where a startup is partnering with a more established company um, or in some cases being acquired by a more established company um, feels like in some cases, kind of the best of both worlds. The, the startup is able to move quickly and be nimble and um, solve some of these upstream challenges and then engage with that larger established partner who has you know, supplier relationships, infrastructure, deeper pockets for sort of scale up and, and build out um, once, once companies are ready to go to market and go to scale. 
Um, I think we'll see more of that type of activity. There are certain subsectors of uh, the fermentation world within alternative proteins that are getting particularly crowded. Um, so I mentioned, you know, multiple companies working on dairy proteins. I think we'll start to see a little bit of consolidation there or um, acquisition or, or aqua hiring um, since talent is a big bottleneck in this space as well. Um, so I think there's, it's, it's good to have that sort of competition, but I think, um, you know, to the extent that that companies can be willing and open um, to partner with these more established leaders once they're they're kind of getting to that point or or even earlier in their uh, development trajectory. I think that's overall a good thing for the the rate of, of progress within this field. Thank you. Thank you again, Liz. Uh, we very much for, appreciate for your presentation and uh, overall participation. Thank you again. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Our next uh, keynote speaker is Dr. Phil Kerr. Uh, Phil is the Chief Technology Officer of Prairie Aquatic. Prairie Aquatic discovers, develops, and commercializes value-added nutrition solutions for global aquaculture, including those produced using unique supply chains within the Northern Plains that deploy identi identity-preserved high protein soybeans produced using leading methods for oilseed production for crop sustainability. Um, Phil has uh, uh, decades of uh, experience uh, from the industry and uh, I feel uh, Phil as a personal mentor, especially on AOCS. So we sit on several boards together and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Phil Kerr to you and he'll be talking about the fermentation technologies in the growing agricultural landscape. Well, thank you, Mehmet, and, and thanks for the interest from the, from the audience. Uh, it's a tremendous uh, opportunity to be able to, to be with uh, uh, every, everyone on the webinar. Uh, thanks to Liz for a great uh, uh, overview of what is a very, very dynamic, very, very compelling and interesting space. So I want to I wanna start today with a, a kind of a summation via a video of a technology that about 10 years ago was literally in, in flasks at a, uh, in a lab bench at a university in the United States. Um, and, uh, and, and so let's, uh, let's start there and then we'll get into the uh, science uh, behind it here. So the supply chains for, for this opportunity uh, literally begins with unique uh, soybean genetics being planted under uh, regenerative ag practices. Uh, conservation tillage is uh, critical. The harvest is controlled and the identity is preserved tightly under uh, storage before uh, leaving the farm and, and then going into primary uh, processing. Uh, in this particular instance, primary processing into uh, uh, Non-hexane produced soybean meal leads to the raw material that comes to our fermentation facility. So here's an aerial view of our fermentation facility that is in eastern uh, South Dakota. Uh, soybean meal uh, coming from these special supply chains is our starting material and starts uh, part of the process that in includes uh, not just fermentation, but, but other bioprocessing and separations. We, uh, we make a, a high protein ingredient that is uh, used in, uh, throughout the world uh, now. Um, aquaculture, but also terrestrial livestock uh, uh, are the target uh, applications. This is an example of our aquaculture uh, lab facility in South Dakota. Uh, there's a, an important uh, co-product stream that comes off of this uh, zero effluent facility. And this is an example that Liz described of a, of a stream that could be further valorized for uh, precision fermentation. Uh, an example of that is a consortium that we are participating in uh, with other academic and uh, soybean grower uh, organizations, including Rice uh, University, the University of Akron, and IdeaChem, where here we're using this co-product stream for the precision fermentation of uh, fatty acids that could go into a number of uh, other 
uh, applications. Uh, just so happens in this particular example, these are C16 uh, and C14 uh, fatty acids. Um, and those could go into a number of uh, uh, both food, but also in uh, uh, industrial applications, including surfactants and shampoos as, as, as an example that we, we showed here. So this, is, uh, this has been a fascinating uh, journey. Our tagline is uh, Prairie Aquatech together, and you'll see this, uh, this theme again and again as uh, we finish the, the rest of my, uh, my presentation for you here today. Um, there's an important context, I think, for, for all of this from our perspective, but I think all of us uh, uh, share in this. And so briefly, I, I want to use this uh, imagery that, is, that has come out of uh, some comprehensive work that, that I think is very seminal and, and top of mind, should be top of mind for all of us that exist within the, the, uh, the ag, food, feed, uh, human nutrition, pet nutrition, livestock nutrition space. Uh, and the concept is, uh, has been termed uh, planetary boundaries. And I think it's a very compelling framework for not only identifying risks that we all face, uh, maybe we are aware, maybe we are not aware, but very, very uh, quickly, we all need to work together to be, make a number of positive changes. Um, this, this particular diagram identifies a, a, a number of uh, critical risk factors that we're all facing. And the ones that I, that I want to uh, draw attention here are at the, at the bottom of this Phil, particular- Phil, uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we can see your screen for some reason. Can you please try resharing, please? Okay. Or if you like, we can share from here. Yeah, let's try this again. Okay. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So this is the image that, that I, I think we need all to, to spend some time uh, uh, thinking about. We talk uh, a lot about uh, things like uh, uh, greenhouse gas control, uh, uh, managing risk to the uh, to the ozone layer on the on the planet, uh, genetic diversity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but but for those of us who are in uh, various roles, various places in in providing food and feed for the planet, uh, oftentimes we don't talk nearly enough about the the so-called biochemical flows down in the in the bottom of this particular figure, and then particularly uh, nitrogen and phosphorus flows are are at a uh, significant risk. And if we don't all uh, look to technologies and look to, to uh, changing behavioral practices, uh, we're quickly going to be at a, at a, at a point uh, collectively where we may not be able to manage back uh, from this particular risk state. So you'll see various themes here in my talk about how we have uh, worked to do that at, uh, at Prairie Aquatech uh, with our customers, okay? Um, the story that I'll tell you today is, uh, is very soy centric, but it is applicable to other uh, uh, crops, as you see at the very end. And this will be a, a lead in to some of the stuff that Vishnu is uh, going to talk to uh, uh, after me. Um, soy, is a, soy is a great starting point because of its uh, efficiency in, in fixing nitrogen, but it too has its uh, challenges in, in terms of uh, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen management. Um, it is the driver for um, animal nutrition across the planet and therefore indirectly human nutrition. But ultimately, if we're going to do what we need to do to manage the risk of, the, of these biological flows, we have to find ways in which we make it easier uh, for uh, proteins coming from, from crops or fermentation or, or alternative uh, cell culture technologies to go directly uh, to humans rather than through animals uh, to humans. So let's talk uh, more um, about that. Um, soy is an interesting crop because uh, inherently it is uh, uh, known for its co-product valorization. And co-product valorization you'll see is a theme for, for us 
and how we manage our particular facility, how we develop the technology to date and how we will expand on this technology going forward. But throughout its modern history, uh, soybeans has had this uh, internal struggle. And a point of fact, it really has two main products and two byproducts. Uh, one of which is uh, primarily protein driven, the so-called meal. Uh, and the second is, um, is uh, the oil. And depending on the, the time of the year and the location in the world, sometimes the meal and the protein is more important and other times the oil is more important when point of fact, both of them are, are very important. And, and it is through this joint importance that uh, we've been able to, to utilize the large capacity of the soy uh, system in the Northern Plains and uh, locate our particular facility that, that uses fermentation and other bioprocessing technologies to enhance the quality so that we can improve the efficiency of um, uh, production in, in both aquaculture and in uh, terrestrial, uh, some terrestrial livestock, okay? So this, this transition of going from you know, feeding protein to livestock uh, to feeding it directly uh, to humans is, uh, is critical. Uh, today, about 97% of the animal feed um, uh, is fed to poultry and livestock, and only 3% of it goes directly into, into human food. So how we manage this transition from that current paradigm to a future state where it goes directly uh, to humans, um, you know, isn't, uh, as we say, isn't sexy, but it's vitally uh, uh, important. And, and so one of the things that is, uh, uh, affects how we uh, uh, manage our priorities and our aspirational visions is that there are profound differences in the efficiency uh, among livestock, whether they be terrestrial or aquatic, in the, uh, in the inherent efficiency uh, in which they are produced and how that uh, efficiency can then lead to uh, better um, uh, nutritional and, and human productivity uh, impacts and also reduced environmental impacts. And this, this table shows you and going from beef to the right to uh, fish to the left, there are just profound uh, improvements in the overall efficiency uh, and conversion, carbon footprint, water consumption as, as we do that. So, so while we ultimately see this, this opportunity to go directly to humans, there is a, a very important transition that we, that we think needs to, to be done and done right. Um, and aquaculture plays an important uh, role in that, in, uh, in our beliefs. Um, in addition to that, not just the efficiency, but the nutritional uh, benefits, uh, particularly uh, relative to red meats or, or something where aquaculture oftentimes has significant advantages. Uh, the, the protein to fat, uh, not only ratio, but, but fat quality is, is oftentimes uh, very desirable in, in fish along with the ability to deliver other important uh, minerals or, or vitamins into the, into the human diet. So there's a case for aquaculture beyond just its efficiency and that is, uh, that is for nutrition. Um, it needs to be done right though. Uh, every uh, animal production system uh, throughout its history has, has had its challenges and aquaculture is no different. Um, but uh, organizations like Best Aquaculture Practices is striving to, um, to really bring uh, aquaculture to a point where um, farm seafood that can be safe, raised sustainably, ethically sourced, all these things done uh, for the benef benefit of the planet as we try to make these transitions is, uh, is vitally uh, important. And so Best Aquacultural Practices Organization is, is one that we, um, uh, that we participate in uh, and we look forward to helping it uh, uh, be more impactful uh, uh, in the future. Aquaculture has this inherent uh, challenge, however. And this particular graph shows you uh, since the mid 90s, the uh, overall production, which is the red line, uh, has gone up by uh, almost fourfold. And at the same time, the, the primary protein source that is used to drive that production, uh, fish meal, has uh, declined by over 50%. And ultimately, this is not uh, sustainable. Uh, we literally mine fish out of uh, certain fisheries around the world and use them as a biological raw material, not all that different than, than coal or other minerals. Um, and management of those fisheries is really critical. Countries are getting better and better at it, but at the end of the day, uh, there's, there's not 
we believe there's not going to be enough uh, uh, fish meal to go around, and therefore we have to make a transition to um, to better plant-based uh, ingredients uh, to support the industry. And so, how have we done that? Um, the innovation that has been behind our efforts uh, has three important components: uh, the inherent material source. Uh, how the, the fermentation and the uh, associated bioprocessing technologies is used to enhance uh, animal and product performance and how can you do that and while still having uh, enhanced environmental impact or all the, the challenges uh, that we face every day. And I'm going to show you how we attempt to, um, to meet that. Uh, for us, this uh, guardianship of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, literally starts at the source. So as I showed you, uh, our supply chains with uh, regenerative ag uh, practices with high protein crops like soybeans, where the seed, the agronomic practices, the quality uh, throughout the production and storage and processing is, is all critical. And if we do that, then we can have full transparency to consumers. And we envision a day where a consumer can literally be able to, to look at a, a um, a food ingredient out of, out of a retail uh, source like uh, Whole Foods and be able to know exactly where uh, foundationally the protein came from that, that led to uh, the, the production of the fish or shrimp or, or the retail product that they have in their hands. And we're working towards that um, all the time. Um, our uh, uh, location sits in one of the, the most uh, productive corridors of high protein crops uh, on the planet. Uh, the production uh, corridor for soybeans in the Northern Plains is shown uh, in this blue uh, oval. And the yellow star is the location of our, our facility. Uh, and within the dry area of our, our facility and our primary suppliers sits uh, in the neighborhood of almost 15 million acres of, uh, of soybeans, uh, all of which uh, ultimately could be made um, higher quality, more sustainable, more impactful for, uh, for aquaculture and livestock uh, production if, uh, if we deploy fermentation and bioprocessing technology um, appropriately. And it can also serve as a foundation to grow so that uh, ingredients coming off of this platform could also be used for uh, companion animals uh, and uh, directly for human uh, consumption as well too. Um, People are responding, our customers are responding. Uh, Jason Mann is, uh, is a key opinion leader within the US uh, uh, trout industry uh, and uh, has been very uh, uh, helpful in, in us trying to uh, prioritize the importance of our supply chain. And, and, and so it's great when you see uh, recommendations like this that uh, you're heading in the right direction. So keep, keep it up and uh, continue to make uh, improvements. And so we thank Jason for, for his comments and his uh, collaboration uh, going forward. Um, we have a patented uh, microbial enhancement platform uh, that uh, takes soy raw materials and, and through a number of uh, features in the process, uh, takes uh, uh, high quality protein, but makes it uh, more uh, bioavailable and utilizable um, uh, by the animals upon which uh, it, is, it is fed. Uh, the technology, as I mentioned, originally started at South Dakota State University uh, and two, uh, two uh, co-inventors there uh, led to the creation of the, of the company and they continue to serve as uh, collaborators and, and uh, guide for our, uh, for our work. And uh, uh, Dr. Karki will uh, follow here shortly, and she continues on in the, the legacy that was started by Drs. Uh, Bill Gibbons and, and Mike Brown. Um, what happens as a result of our process is shown here in this slide. Uh, soybeans on the left and our microbially enhanced protein on the right. Uh, basically, what you see is a significant reduction in the amount of oil uh, that's in the final product, uh, protein uh, content goes up uh, dramatically and you end up with a final product that is largely uh, protein and uh, polysaccharides with a minimum amount of, uh, of ash and minerals uh, and a small amount of, of oil. What also happens is that not only do you concentrate the protein, but you change it uh, significantly in terms of its molecular weight distribution. So on the far right side of this, uh, this particular gel analysis, you see uh, the molecular weight uh, distribution in the stain portion for MEPRO, and you can see the molecular weight distribution is much, much smaller 
uh, than it is in, in other soy uh, ingredients. Uh, soy protein concentrates are, are shown sort of in the middle of the slide. And then the starting soybean meal is also shown. And what you see is much higher molecular weight proteins uh, that are present in, in storage protein form are converted in the process into uh, highly bioavailable, smaller uh, proteins and peptides that, that go into the product that, that in turn goes into the feed that, that go into aquaculture and uh, terrestrial livestock. Um, an interesting uh, and, and a very desirable uh, side benefit that comes uh, with this particular product that we've seen in the shrimp industry is that not only uh, can you uh, provide high quality nutrition, but actually the survivability of uh, young shrimp uh, from larval stage uh, through, throughout their life uh, has been shown to be able to be increased uh, with uh, the inclusion of, of uh, microbially enhanced protein, or as we call it, imipro, uh, into these diets. And so, as you can see, uh, the control diets are, are in the red bars and uh, the imipro containing diets are in blue. And uh, across all these different stages, you see a nice uh, increase in the survivability in, in the, uh, white shrimp. From an environmental standpoint, uh, the fermentation and bioprocessing also uh, it does a nice job of, of converting the phosphorus that is commonly present in a very unavailable form in a number of agricultural raw materials like uh, soybean. Um, and this is incredibly important in, in certain aquaculture systems because of the, the impact that the feed has on water quality. And, and an example of a collaboration that we had in the trout industry and in the United States is one with Russian Waters. Um, here's the president uh, of Russian Waters where he was literally f going to face having to close his operation because the state of Wisconsin had made um, you know, decisions that they wanted to reduce the amount of phosphorus going, going into the environment from all sources, uh, including farm fish. And, and he was not going to be able to meet those requirements and, unless he raised a lot less fish on his farm, which was not going to be economically uh, viable for his operation, or he was going to have to add a lot of capital equipment for uh, wastewater treatment. And neither one of those was going to be financially sustainable for his operation. And fortunately, we were able to develop collaboration with Peter and his team and, and be able to change the fees with which he was feeding his trout and by the inclusion of Imipro and its enhanced nitrogen and phosphorus utilization, he was able to reduce the amount of phosphorus in his operation by uh, over 70%, which allowed him to stay, uh, uh, stay in operation. And uh, Peter and his team are uh, uh, one of the exclusive uh, suppliers of trout to uh, Whole Foods uh, to this day. Um, various aspects of the technology uh, scale up, uh, uh, as I've as I shown, we, we have everything from uh, genetics going into the ground to uh, uh, fish and shrimp uh, application testing capabilities. And it's really this type of integrated science and technology so that you have feedback loops between process development, product development, product application testing, and, and customer uh, interfacing that is, that is made for success uh, uh, for us at uh, Perry Architect. So here's, a, here's an image of, uh, of kind of where we are. Uh, this integrated uh, biorefinery vision is, is um, how we operate. Uh, today, the primary product is, uh, is Imipro, um, but we, uh, we currently are uh, selling our soy soluble stream into the beef uh, uh, cattle industry uh, uh, in, the, in our region. But as I said, we're actively collaborating to, to look at that uh, soy soluble stream, that syrup stream, if you will, that contains uh, sugars and peptides uh, for, for other applications. Uh, as I mentioned with a collaboration with United Soybean Board uh, Consortium is looking to convert uh, those particular materials into fatty acids uh, that could be used in a number of applications. Um, but there's other materials uh, in that uh, stream, interesting, uh, uh, peptides, for instance, that, that might uh, serve as nitrogen sources in precision fermentation, um, derivatives for, um, you know, surfactant, uh, novel surfactant technologies, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, a lot of work is needed to be done in, in terms of how to, to fractionate and harvest efficiently the materials in those streams, but it is that concept that will ultimately 
result in this fully integrated biorefinery that uh, will drive our, uh, our business to the, to the next level. Uh, getting a lot of uh, recognition uh, over the last uh, several years, sort of pre-pandemic, uh, and so we're very uh, grateful to, to have been recognized by some influ influential organisms, uh, influential organ organizations in the, uh, in the aquaculture industry, and, and we thank them for, for their recognition. And uh, in spite of a, a global pandemic for almost two years now, we've, we've gone from a facility that just started in the, in the summer of uh, 2019 now, and, and we have uh, uh, commercial uh, operations and sales uh, through, throughout the world. Uh, heavy emphasis in, uh, in Norway for the salmonid industry, the, the US trout industry, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean and in Central and South America for, for shrimp is the areas of emphasis, but we have activities going on uh, throughout, throughout the world. And uh, so we think uh, we're not done. Uh, opportunities to use this type of technology, uh, tunable and scalable, uh, we think is applicable to crops like, uh, like canola, and pea and, and corn and uh, barley uh, and, and others. Um, and so Liz has uh, mentioned uh, examples uh, of this and, and we're a living example of, of how uh, this has come from, like, from the lab bench in a university to the scale that we are now. Our facility is about 30,000 tons of, uh, of, our, of our main product uh, you know, per annum. Uh, and it's been fascinating. It's been frustrating. We learn uh, new things every day that, that we apply. And it's through these, uh, this effort and the commitment to be stewards of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus that drives us uh, every day. And we look forward to, um, uh, to improving all the, all the time. So, so with that, I'll, I'll leave it there. And if there's uh, time for any questions, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer them uh, from, from the audience. So, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Phil. Uh, again, uh, very much appreciate for your attendance, uh, participation, and the presentation. Uh, just for time's sake, if we can take maybe one question, Amy, is there anything from online or? Okay. Test. There we go. Um, there's a question here online that came in earlier. And this was, what do you think Saskatchewan can offer to the fermentation industry? Well, um, Saskatchewan is, uh, sits in the, uh, you know, the heart of uh, agricultural productivity within, within Canada. And, and personally, uh, it's, it's a natural life, I think. And it sits right across the border from, from us, if you will. Uh, and I think a lot of the principles that, that the center is, uh, is driving um, and the principles that it's had in place uh, uh, for a long, long time uh, can be leveraged uh, so, so that together, you know, food development, um, fermentation, uh, I think for a lot of applications, we have to always think that the texture and structure is going to be very important. I know Liz mentioned a lot of stuff about food, uh, meat alternatives in the food space. I think it's uh, is a best example so far, but we can never forget that structure and texture are very important there. And so extrusion technology as a companion technology to, um, to fermentation is an area where I think uh, Saskatchewan has got a lot of uh, uh, skills and expertise and, and historical leadership. And so I, I would see uh, a lot of technical leadership for the integration of, of those adjacent technologies uh, driving uh, you know, new product development for, uh, for many years uh, to come. Thank you. Thanks again, Phil. Uh, with the, uh, the next presentation, I'd like to introduce Dr. Vishnu Karki. Dr. Karki is an assistant professor in the Department of Biology and Microbiology at South Dakota State University. And Dr. Karki's research interests lie in the bioprocessing within a context of value-added product development via renewable resource utilization. With that, Dr. Karki. All right, thank you, Mehmet, and thank you, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, uh, my previous colleagues or speakers, Liz and Phil, gave really good overview of fermentation for the um, 
uh, food and feed applications. I think my uh, presentation will be a little bit more into the uh, science. Uh, so I'm in academia, so my, my work is more into the uh, research. So I'll present some of the uh, work that we have been doing in this fermentation space. To begin with, um, the agricultural resources, it is estimated that about one third of the food product that is produced for the human consumption ends up being in the agricultural waste. Uh, to give you a perspective, that number is about 1.3 billion tons per year of that agricultural resource is available as a waste that agricultural resources are going into the animal feed at a very lower portion of that, but most of that uh, product is uh, generally dis discarded or disposed as, an, in a, as a solid residue or composted or basically uh, uh, incinerated. With that, um, uh, um, if you look into the range of these agricultural residues, they vary significantly. They, it can be from the husk hull to seeds to the uh, byproduct of the industry. Um, just to elaborate a little more on that, the one thing that is really common between these agricultural residues is they are highly nutrient rich. Uh, so they are rich in carbohydrates, polysaccharides, proteins, minerals, vitamins, carbon, nitrogen, all kind of uh, nutrient source. Um, and uh, based on the origin of these residues, they are categorically divided into agricultural residues or industrial residues. Agricultural residues can vary significantly from molasses, from the grains to seed meal to uh, industrial residues, for example, lignocellulosic polymers to carbon compounds to sometimes even the photosynthetic microalgaes. All of these compounds, as I said, are nutrient rich and they are significantly varied in composition. These are underutilized. So with the growing population and there is increasing demand for the food and feed application, there have been a lot of research or, or the focus has been in developing a technology to make this product uh, as a high value product for human food, energy or feed application. This flowchart kind of gives you in a little bit summary here uh, with the focus on fermentation. Any of these substrates could be converted or through the fermentation technology into a single cell protein for the human food or animal feed, or they could simply be pretreated and used for animal feed. For example, boiling, cooking can be a mechanism. Or these substrates could be used for producing a commercial enzymes, and those enzymes could be used for a sacrification of this wide range of substrates to produce a wide range of monomeric sugars. Those sugars can further be fermented into a number of the other evaluated compounds. So essentially, these agricultural resources can be converted or it can be routed into a different product through the fermentation process. So essentially, the fermentation is a very simple process. It's been used uh, in a food and feed or a pharma in very, very, very many commercial products for centuries. The microbial fermentation uses the microbes to create a chemical change in this product so that this the feed additives or a food, uh, sorry, food additives or a feed um, components could be produced. Microbial fermentation is thriving and also driving a bioeconomy in lately uh, in a various sector as our very first speaker kind of gave us a very good overview of how the uh, fermentation in the technology is taking a bigger space and followed by our next speaker, um, Dr. Phil, who kind of saw how a technology that was invented in a lab at South Western University is now leading a, um, a meeting the food and feed demand all across the world. The reason that fermentation technology is um, uh, taking this space is because the fermentation has been used traditionally and has a potential to 
produce the product with a several characteristics. For example, the substrates with the varied chemical composition could be fermented under for optimum conditions, for example, temperature parameters and all those different kinds of fermentation conditions and could be uh, converted these residues into a high protein or digestible protein, could be converted into a product of a desirable texture, flavor, color, and as well as the other additional components that are healthy and functional. With this, on other benefits of the fermentation techniques or the technique the fermentation is taking over this space is because the farmland, the growing population, and there is a limited farmland is a biggest concern. And the fermentation technically do not require the additional farmland. Uh, so that is another um, reason that it has a potential uh, to uh, to convert these bio uh, agricultural residues into a high value compound. Um, fermentations categorically divided into a two groups. One is submergisted fermentation. Submergisted fermentation is a proven commercial technique. Um, it uses a excess amount of water during the fermentation process, so which allows the fermentation condition, fermentation processes to uh, be controlled for their optimal um, efficiency or optimal process condition. For example, temperature, pressure, um, sorry, temperature or pH or uh, aeration can be controlled easily because there is uh, excess water, so mixing is easy. Um, uh, but uh, the downside of the process is that because there is an excess amount of the water, the downstream processing tends to be costly uh, because you have to dry, separate, or the, every unit costs the money. So that is the one disadvantage with the submergisted fermentation. Solid state fermentation, on the other hand, uh, is uh, completed in absence of a free free water. So basically, it has a less moisture than the submerged state fermentation. Um, submerged state fermentation is highly applicable for the fungi, especially the filamentous fungi that we are working currently. The filamentous fungi, uh, this uh, solid state fermentation kind of replicates the natural environment that fungi grow. And that's why um, uh, it is easy to operate. For example, um, enzyme production, the commercial enzyme production or the mushroom production industry uses the solid stage fermentation uh, at a commercial uh, scale. The other advantage of this uh, solid stage fermentation is the downstream processing is relatively um, cheaper as compared to submerged stage fermentation. For example, there's a minimal drying needed or the, the unit operations for the purifications or for the, um, the processing of the product is uh, lesser uh, than the submerged stage fermentation. However, the disadvantage with this process is if the solid state fermentation is done with the uh, single cellular, uh, single cell uh, microbes, like mostly the bacteria instead of uh, um, filamentous fungi, which can penetrate the residues, um, they might, the process efficiency might be lesser uh, because of the less, uh, there is a limited mass transfer because of the um, no uh, free water or mixing is limited, as you can see which also limits the uh, fermentation optimization. For example, there is a limited opportunity to scale up in terms of the uh, temperature or pH control. So those are the disadvantages with the soil distilled fermentation. So both the processes comes with the uh, plus and minuses. And then when we are working in terms of determining the optimal fermentation condition, we have to assess the feasibility of the both processes depending upon whatever the end goal is. This was just the brief introduction about the agricultural residues and the fermentation, the basic of fermentations. So I would like to switch a little bit of gear here and uh, bring you all to the, my research focus that I have been working for the past several years within the space of agricultural residues, but mostly with the oilseed meals. Um, as we just uh, saw, saw, the soybean-based industry uh, company, uh, basically Prairie Aquatic, how the soybean meal is now can, is uh, um, sold as an ME pro for the for meeting the aquaculture industry, a need for a fish meal, right? So and. Phil rightly said that uh, we are looking for more alternatives and to meet or to make the use of agricultural residues and to meet the global need of these alternative 
proteins, we have to find out what else is there. So within this scope, within the goal of that, we have been working with a wide range of oilseed meals, um, ranging from canola to sunflower to flax, camelina, carinata, uh, are some of these that I have been working Besides oilseed meals, I'm also working with the other agricultural commodities like DDZS, sorghum, guar gum are some of the examples. Um, briefly, the plant-based proteins are within the oilseed in uh, scope of oilseeds. The oilseeds are primarily grown for the oil. So they are uh, pressed or extract used for through the process through the solvent extraction methods to remove the oil that has a mostly industrial application but in the process there is a residual amount of a meal is product as produced as a co-product so in my research i'm looking at the valorizing this co-meal uh, meal as a co-product of the process for a value-added product through the fermentation process like this flow diagram here summarizes how the seed production and processing industry for every one kilogram of the oil, there is about two kilogram of the meal is generated. Depending upon the type of the oil seed, the protein can vary from 30 to 50 percent. And these oil seeds usually have a very well balanced of amino acid. Currently, soybean is the only primary leading oil seed meal that has been used for a human food as well as an animal feed. So second to the soybean meal is a canola meal, which is producing a large quantities. And similarly with the um, breeding and uh, advancement in breeding technologies, there are other brassicaceae oil seeds, for example, carinata and camelina are also growing rapidly in South Dakota state or in the Northern Plain region here or in the other, other states here. So these oil seed meal have currently almost no value or no use because of the presence of this high level of anti-nutritional factors. Uh, could be glucosinolates, could be phytic acids, could be high fiber or oligosaccharides. Or uh, uh, because of these uh, anti-nutritional factors, the nutrient digestibility is very limited. Therefore, their use in animal feed is also limited to 10 to 20 percent, uh, depending upon the animal uh, the animal they are used for feeding. In our process, we are using a very simple approach of uh, bioconverting this oil seed meal uh, by using the filamentous fungi. Uh, and the goal is here to use these filamentous fungi that are generally regarded as a safe, and then uh, they can grow under the solid as well as the submerged fermentation conditions, and they can produce a complex uh, enzyme complex that will enable the removal of all the anti-nutritional factors. And then at the end, we have in a concentrated protein meal with, with the improved nutritional and functional characteristics. So um, this is a one study. Currently, we have uh, been working with the canola meal for the past three, four years, and we have done various uh, um, uh, processing, we have applied various processing techniques to improve the nutritional quality of canola meal. In the process, what we have found out is that canola meal, um, unlike the soybean, because soybean, during the pre-processing of the soybean, hulls are removed. So when the soybean meal is uh, recovered during the oil extraction process, it has a lesser amount of fibers as compared to the canola meal, because canola meal seeds are very small and the seeds are, the hulls are intact that contributes to a significant amount of very resistant fibers are present in the meal. So we found out through our series of studies that we did is that fiber is very resistant to even with the microbial uh, fermentation and uh, we were still seeing a lot of uh, fibers uh, present in the um, fermented meal. So in this study we uh, wanted to see if the co-cultures, by application of co-cultures, if we could improve uh, the fiber degradation. Mm -hmm. 
So this is just a very brief graphical uh, abstract here where exon extracted canola meal is commercially available canola meal. So we took that and then we inoculated that with the series of uh, microbes uh, individually or in combination of two and three. And then we had a uh, um, fermented meal and we did some proximate analysis to see how the nutritional characteristic changed. Um, just to give you a brief um, background, during the cook culture, we need to ensure uh, that these microbes can actually grow synergistically uh, together. So we did some testing, like you can see here in the plates, and so there was no inhibition. So we use these three microbes that are um, known to be superior in uh, digesting or in removing the antinutritional in canola meal. So we use the 50% um, of the canola meal and 50% moisture and inoculated with these microbes individually and in combination and incubated for a uh, seven days and under static condition as you can see here they were there was uh, there was uninhibited control just for comparison purpose and there were the uh, meals those were fermented with the mono and co-cultures and we dried that at a low temperature and ground and the several other characteristics were, uh, were uh, determined as you can see, one thing that was very prominent was this my canola mills heavily supported the growth of these microbes, as you can see from uh, the tubes here. And during the mono and as well as the co-culture, these microbes were growing uh, really well on the substrate. After the fermentation was completed, because there was no residual water, the solids were just dried directly. And as you can see, there was, as compared to raw and controlled, there was a removal of some of the solubles out of this ferment, uh, out of the meal, and the proteins were concentrated uh, as low as from 42 to as high as about uh, 50%. There was about 10% increase. Um, so during this processing, the microbes are expected to metabolize the carbohydrate and release the, um, um, the, the weight loss is because of the metabolization of the carbohydrate into the CO2 and other components. That's why we see some dry uh, matter loss. And another interesting thing here is these microbes, because we are in the space of fermentation, though the substrate is same, the processing conditions remains the same, the microorganism, the fermentation end product depends on the type of the microbes that are being used. For example, here, NCRASA, the solid recovery with the NCRASA was the least, uh, which means there was the highest level of soluble, uh, solubilization, uh, which implies that there was a little bit of a fiber degradation, for example, crude fiber, ADF, and NDF as compared to others. Uh, but in terms of the glucosinolate removal or in terms of the phytic acid removal, there was a pololens was better for the glucosinolate. Similarly, the combination of a pololens and TDCI was better uh, as compared to NCRASA alone. So the combination of a pololens and NCRASA was uh, basically uh, throughout the spectrum was best uh, combination in terms of fiber removal as well as the other and other um, um, components that I haven't included all the data, but yeah, we looked into the different components and this combination was the best. At the end, it implies that the microorganisms, although this meal supports the growth of all microorganisms, however, the, the extent of the protein concentration or fiber removal or the uh, anti-nutritional, other anti-nutritional nutritional factors removal uh, is uh, different. The effect of these microbes on these different components varies significantly. And fiber reduction still was uh, up to the 15 to 16% only. So, which means that even with the co-culture, because the co-culture, if you look into the nature, the mixed cultures are very prominent. Uh, for example, composting or during the uh, wastewater treatment, the mixed culture has have been used very, very successfully. But with this canola meal, with the seven-day fermentation, um, the individual or a co-culture fermentation was efficient in reducing significant amount of other components, but fiber was still resistant and there was very minimal reduction. 
With that, our hypothesis was that maybe during the canola milk fermentation with these microbes, uh, the fermentation time is not enough to produce the enough level of cellulases because cellulases are cellulase enzymes are required uh, for the um, the for the degradation of fibers. With that in mind, we did another study where our goal was to uh, basically look into the um, uh, um, different substrates with the same microbes and evaluate uh, the uh, enzyme um, activities. So we took the three different type of meal. One was hexanex target canola meal, and the same meal was washed with the water to remove any solubles. And then we also had a sprout meal. We did some sprouting study, and then we had a sprouted and defatted meal. The composition of these three meals was entirely different in terms of fiber, protein, and all sugar components. So all of these meals were uh, subjected under the solid and submerged state condition under the mono and co-culture inoculation. And we measured specifically cellulase, endocellulase, and beta-glucosidase activity. This slide here, as you can see, just gives a flow diagram where submerged state fermentation was for five days and the solid state fermentation was uh, for seven days. And we had a significant different level of solids uh, to begin with. Submerged state has only 10% of solids and so solid state had 50% um, of solids to, during the fermentation. Once the fermentation was concluded, we took the samples from the process and we took the liquid sample to measure the enzyme activity. Um, this is in a table here which summarizes the enzymes during the submerged state fermentation. Um, the HECM is hexane extracted, CSM is a canola sprout meal and WHECM is a washed canola meal. The first here, the cellulase activity across the table here, if you look at it, it was a very minimal, less than zero point, less, less than one technically, um, less than one FPU per unit gram was very residual amount of cellulases were there. Uh, if looking at these numbers as compared to the literature review numbers on the cellulases, they are very, very low because the literature reporting on a lignocellulosic biomass where TDCI is known to be a very good uh, cellulase producer. And the enzyme activity uh, uh, as compared to ours to the literature was significantly low. Uh, endoglycanase activity is also lower than what is reported in literature, but however, with the apolulence, we had a better activity. And beta glucosidase activity, unlike uh, uh, the cellulase and endo, was significantly high and very comparable with whatever in the literature. But beta glucosidase entirely do not uh, act on the fibers if there is a cellulase deficiency. So we found out that what we have been seeing and what we have been uh, hypothesizing seem correct that with the cellulase, low cellulase activity were uh, the responsible for the low fiber degradation during the submerged state fermentation. Pretty much same thing was found with the solid state fermentation. However, the activity, the cellulase activity was slightly higher um, uh, uh, with the uh, solid state fermentation. Um, similarly, the enzyme activity the, were better for the indo and beta as compared to the submerged state fermentation. So it is known that solid state fermentation is suitable for the enzyme production, for the commercial enzyme production. And we were, we were able to see that. In our previous study, if you look at it, the ANCRASA and the combination of apolulin and ANCRASA did a little bit of a fiber degradation. And this data supports our previous finding that the enzyme activities for ANCRASA uh, and uh, also uh, the combination of the ANCRASA and apolulin was uh, significantly higher than any other individual strains. With this, um, what we were able to, with this study, we were able to see that the cellulases, indo and beta, all activities were uh, detected, but cellulase with very low levels. And then enzyme production significantly varied depending upon the initial substrate type, because here, though it's a canola meal, they were differently processed. So the composition of the meal um, really affects the enzyme production. Uh, solid state and submerged state fermentation yielded a different level of enzymes, and that's a known theory, and we were able to see it with the canola meal as well. And co-culture fermentation was better than monoculture in terms of enzyme activity. 
what this study gave us or with this study's findings, we are able to, I think we, we can kind of lay out a foundation that uh, fermentation enables the removal of anti-nutritional factors, but if we, and that can something be optimized depending upon whatever is the end goal. If the end goal is to remove the higher high fiber degradation or if end goal is to remove the higher level of fiber, I think we should aim for a longer fermentation time because generally the enzyme um, uh, production is, um, um, it takes place during the longer solid state fermentation of um, 15 to 20 days. So for in our processing, most of the phytics and glucosinolates and oligosaccharides are removed as, low, as shorter as three days time. So there is a fermentation again, going back to what Lee said and what um, uh, Phil said earlier, the fermentation process is a tricky in terms of it needs to be optimized individually and before it gets to be scaled up. That are the challenges with the fermentation and also the provides the opportunity for throughout the uh, processing uh, from the beginning to the end of the process where every entity all involved can uh, work together in designing optimal fermentation process, be it uh, um, grinding, milling, to fermentation, to designing reactor, to the feedings. So those are the things that uh, we have been able to find. And then all of my our work, we have a collaborators. All these converted meals are uh, uh, usually subject to our aquaculture trials to see the preference of the fish, whether they like it or not. But I'm not presenting those data here because of the time limits here. Uh, with this in the summary, uh, coming back to the space of fermentation, it is evident that um, um, agroindustrial residues are readily available. They are environmentally friendly and there is a, they are sustainable, they're plant-based and they can meet the growing demand of alternative protein sources or the alternative food and feed supply. So, but uh, fermentation is is potential solution it because all wide range of my uh, the agricultural commodities can be um, you know, converted or by, uh, can be converted through the microbial processes but the challenge is because they are so different in their chemical composition they require that every material needs to be assessed for their fermentability in terms of the process efficiency so that fermentation process can be individually designed and optimized before it is being scaled up so that for, for the maximum product yield and efficiency and the product quality. Um, so within this space, I'm working with the peas and uh, uh, with the goal of removing flavor component, uh, with sorghum, removing the tannins and all these spaces. So we are finding some interesting results uh, and I hope to continue in this area further. With this, I would like to thank everybody and uh, I will take the questions if you may have any. Thank you. Thank you, Bishnu. Uh, and again, just in terms of time, uh, we have basically uh, time for one question. If uh, Do we have any questions from audience or online participants? We have one question online, yeah. um, and it is, what are the main challenges in fermenting co-products to be suitable for human consumption rather than animal feed? That's excellent question. There are the many, there are, I think with the human, when it comes to the human consumption, there are a lot of allergies. Allergen is the biggest concern and then toxicity. And then there are the labeling issues. And so that is something that, uh, is a little bit critical than the animal feed. Uh, I think that's the space that I'm not directly working yet, but uh, that is a space I think is a known um, challenges with this one. Sometimes it tends to be a, uh, the product, if you are harvesting in our process, we are harvesting the product uh, biomass together with the microbial cells. And so we do not know if they pose any kind of allergenicity to the humans. And that's something that needs to be studied. And that could be the biggest challenge. Thank you, Bishnu. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, just ask a round of applause uh, for all the keynote speakers. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you, Phil. And thank you, Vishnu. Uh, with that, we'll take five minute break and then we'll be back around 2.32, 33. So.
And then we have coffee and the drinks uh, for our audience here in Saskatoon.
Hello. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Well, welcome back, everybody. If I can. Uh... Everybody seems to be enjoying, but yeah. So. Well, welcome back everybody. I like to uh, start the second part of the webinar. And in the part two, we'll be talking about the advancing fermentation processing in Western Canada. And uh, we'll be uh, introducing our project partners. Uh, as part of this session, the overall Q&A will be held until the end of the session. So there won't be any Q&A for uh, after each presenter. Amy, everything okay? Okay, so uh, with that, I'd like to start with uh, the first presenter, Miss Megan McGarvey. Uh, Megan, can you? Okay, Megan is uh, here. Uh, Megan is, says Director of Intellectual Property, but I can announce here, Megan is the new Chief uh, Technology Officer for Protein Industries Canada. It's been announced today. Congratulations, Megan, again. And Megan will be talking about the opportunities with pick and overview of the Canadian innovation landscape. Megan, please. Thank you, Mehmet. It's, uh, it's been a big week. I maybe haven't thought through these slides as much as I normally would have, so we'll see what I say up here. But uh, thank you. Um, so I guess I'll just start by thanking the Food Center and Egg West and all the other partners in the project um, for the chance to be here today to um, speak about Protein Industries Canada and why we saw fermentation as an important part of the work that we were doing in our, our first round of the program. Um, and the importance of really bringing scalable fermentation capacity into Canada. Um, so most of you probably know, but Protein Industries Canada is an industry-led, not-for-profit organization um, we were created to position Canada as a global source of high quality plant protein and plant-based co-products. We're one of Canada's five super clusters. So in 2018, the government of Canada um, looked for and identified five areas of high economic growth potential for the country um, and established the super clusters to invest about a billion dollars into technology and commercialization projects in each of those sectors. Um, Protein Industries Canada received approximately $170 million of that investment. And together with our industry partners, we're on track to leverage that into about half a billion dollars of project investment. So um, we've had a lot of great projects come through and a lot of work is getting done. And we're about to embark on a really big year um, because in budget 2022, the government of Canada announced another $750 billion investment for round two of the super clusters. So we are now starting to work on recapitalization. Um, the super clusters have a national mandate, but we are located sort of regionally. Um, so the, the other super clusters, just in case you're curious, are the digital super cluster in British Columbia, um, next generation manufacturing in Ontario, scale AI, and the ocean super cluster on the East Coast. Um, and something that's really cool that's happened at PIC over the last six months or so is that we now have folks all the way from Vancouver Island to Prince Edward Island on our team. And so we really are a coast to coast organization as well now. I'm gonna back it up here a bit. Um, so PIC was founded with the vision of building Canadian leadership in plant-based protein. So our protein focus is really defined around crops that are grown at broad acre scale in Canada. And we have projects focused on pulses, um, canola, oats, soy, and or a combination of the crops. Some of our projects really do sort of span all of those crops. The investments that we make um, span the value chain of agriculture. And so um, we're really looking to support Canadian companies in increasing the value of crops that we grow. And further to developing technology, we also invest in what we call capacity building projects. And so that is where um, our work with the Food Centre has come into play. Capacity building projects are ones that, you know, don't necessarily focus on growth of a particular company or group of companies, but they're more so focused on 
um, opportunities that will benefit the whole ecosystem. And so having the food center be home to a fermentation facility that is scalable and will allow companies to come in and um, really expand their fermentation capabilities are, we saw as a really important investment for us to make through Protein Industries Canada. So we are structured on a membership model. Um, so in our case, we, we have folks come in and buy a membership and that gives them access to networking events, market research, our digital member portal, as well as the fund for the different projects that we fund. Um, we're sitting at about 200 members within PIC right now. And these companies represent really the whole industry. Um, we have manufacturing, egg technology, services, um, processors, public institutes, and seed companies. And really the majority of our members um, are small and medium sized enterprises. So the super clusters have a really strong focus on helping companies in the sector to grow um, and to kind of get over some of those hurdles that face a small and medium sized enterprise. Um, everyone in the room and, and online today probably appreciates that uh, the agri-food sector cuts across many types of technology and we had 170 million to commit to projects and that's a generous sum for sure. Uh, but we did need to be somewhat focused in terms of, of where those investments would go. And so you've likely heard if you've been watching PIC us talk a lot about the four pillars. So create, grow, make and sell. Um, our create projects have been focused on breeding work. So getting sort of the best genomics into the ground that we can. Our grow product projects are more focused on sort of digital technologies or technologies that will have an implication for the whole, whole value chain. Make projects is, is really where we start to see an application for fermentation technology. So that is co-product and um, utilization of all streams of a crop and looking at new value added processing technologies. And then the final pillar, which is cell is probably where, you know, even more of the fermentation aspect comes into things. This is where we talk about novel food and novel feed ingredients and creation of those products. Um, so we have this slide up to, to sort of summarize progress to date. So phase one of the super clusters have an end date of March, 2023 which means that by that date, all of the funds that we have to invest need to have been spent by our project proponents and we need to be reimbursing them. Um, we have at this point fully committed our allocation of 173 million and we expect that the industry leverage will bring um, the total value of our roughly 50 projects up to a value of about $500 million. Um, the projects that we fund are all driven by industry, so it's, it's industry coming in with technology ideas that they want to work on, and it's collaborative, so at least two for-profit entities work on all of the projects that we fund. Um, we are working on recapitalization. We are fully committed at this point, but I think, you know, we're always open to continuing to have conversations about new project opportunities, whether they, they fit into sort of the final end of this tranche of funding, we have about 10 months of runway left on that, or if we're looking toward April 2023, when we'll be looking to take in a whole new swath of, of new projects. And this slide I really like because it gives a snapshot of the companies who are involved. Um, so this is, it's really a quick view of um, our partners across Canada and gives you an indication of where the companies are geographically. And you'll note that we do have a few international partners as well. Um, so a few of our projects do have companies from the US or I think also UK participating in their projects. Um, in many cases, the projects are structured on a value chain. So we'll have companies come in who each work at a different point on the value chain and the, the output from one company becomes the input for the next and so on down the chain. And we found that that really works well um, and has been a big advantage for our super cluster. Um, so I've really you know, focused a lot today on um, the work that PIC member companies are doing. But a lot of our attention right now is being toward, turned towards the future with the renewal of the super clusters and, and thinking forward. And so toward that end and, and looking forward, um, PIC worked on development of a roadmap for Canada to grow the plant-based food, feed and ingredient sector to 25 billion and provide 10% of the world's plant-based food products by 2035. Um, this this uh, roadmap is called the road to 25 billion and it's really, uh, a framework for Canada. So it's not pick specific, but it's, you know, all of the things that industry is going to need to do together in order to get Canada to achieve that goal. And I think 
you know, at, at the end of the day, the reason I wanted to, to touch on the road to 25 billion here is I think we're just starting to scratch the surface on what can be done with technologies like fermentation to add additional value to the products that we're growing. I think our keynote speakers did a really good job of talking about um, the ability to have higher quality proteins or to use co-products in a different way. And so bringing, um, bringing this scale of scalable fermentation to Canada and having companies be able to come here to develop their technology where we grow the crops and where we're doing the ingredient processing will really strengthen sort of that, that far sell aspect of the value chain. And so we're looking forward to um, continuing to work with the food center and the other partners in the project on um, helping this project really take off and bring that expertise to Canada and have people here who can do that work. So I think that is what I had planned to say. Um, so I will stop there. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Our next uh, presenter is Dr. Darren Korber. Uh, Darren is the department head of the Food and Bioproduct Sciences at University of Saskatchewan. And Darren will be talking about the introduction to program and current research areas in fermentation. Darren will be dialing uh, online. Can Darren, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I hear you. Perfect. I'm just uh, searching for the right uh, slide uh, deck to share here. Can you all see the uh, title slide there? Yes, so if you can maybe. Okay, and you can hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mehmet and uh, Welcome everybody. Uh, this is a really good session going so far. I've enjoyed the keynote speakers uh, uh, in particular. And so it's really good to hear uh, some of the words from uh, people that are uh, sort of on the front lines, breaking new territory and working towards advancing fermentation science. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a high level overview of what goes on in our department. Uh, so we're at the University of Saskatchewan in the College of Agriculture and Bioresources and uh, our department is Food and Bioproduct Sciences. Uh, myself, Mike Nickerson and Tak Tanak are involved in this uh, collaborative project, uh, PIC funded project here to sort of enhance the ecosystem in fermentation. Okay, uh, our department is relatively small, but I would say highly intensive in terms of research. So we've got a much bigger footprint in research uh, sort of punching above our weight class considerably uh, with uh, our faculty all engaged in a wide range of uh, research themes. And so you can see the bottom, some of these themes. Uh, I would just suggest that this is a, a short list, but you know, between food microbiology, enzymology, and then some of the protein lipid starch quality and utilization work, uh, as well as bioprocessing, these are the areas that uh, food fermentation cross cuts. Uh, fairly uh, nicely. And so our faculty are uh, to varying degrees involved in that kind of work. As you can see, you know, one, one, uh, I'll apologize for our, our new tenure track hire in meat chemistry, meat science, uh, and I'm just joking, uh, but this is a position that we uh, needed to refill, but I would say that we've been interested in hiring a new person in fermentation for a while, but the university, it's tough, tough territory to make new hires these days. Uh, but we're waiting for better times to try to advance fermentation as a priority. And it, in actuality, it has been one of our priorities for the last maybe 15 years. Um, and so what, what I'm going to show you on this slide is just some of the, a small snapshot of some of the research done by uh, our faculty, uh, sort of clustered in terms of collaborators. And I give Mike Nickerson credit uh, as our uh, SRP chair in uh, protein quality and utilization. Um, he sort of uh, involved myself and uh, uh, him and him and Tack probably involved me uh, as a microbiologist in uh, some of the work that they were doing, and uh, Mike certainly doing uh, in terms of pulse protein uh, quality and utilization. And in that area, we were looking towards. I, I think a common theme in a lot of this work is improving functionality. Sorry, improving functionality and nutrition, maybe eliminating anti-nutritional factors. Uh, all working towards uh, enhancing the suitability of protein isolates or protein uh, fractions for use as ingredients in different food products. And so uh, we've sort of employed solid state or submerged fermentation technologies, uh, looking at different types of pulse crops uh, to sort of uh, go down that road. We've been doing that for probably 
seven or seven or so, maybe eight years. Uh, and you know, earlier Dr. Tanaka and myself had been working on uh, other fermentation sort of bioproducts or byproduct bioproduct type uh, uh, research. In one case, looking at uh, bioethanol uh, byproduct glycerol and utilizing that to produce green platform chemicals, 1,3-propane diol by metabolic engineering of producing strain. Um, another uh, sort of cluster includes uh, uh, the strategic research uh, uh, investigation grant that uh, Dr. I received. And so Dr. Tanaka and myself work on uh, looking, instead of protein in this case, looking at uh, another fraction that would come out of start, or pulse proteins, and that's the starch-rich fraction. So if you fractionate the uh, the crops, you, you could have a protein-rich rich fraction, the starch-rich fraction. Well, pulse starches aren't as valuable uh, as protein, and uh, hence there's an interest to try to convert those into higher-value products uh, by fermentation-based bioconversion. So you give, give basically carbon source to microorganisms, they produce biomass, and that is then going to enhance or enrich uh, the uh, sort of the end product in terms of, you know, microorganism protein. Uh, and for food and feed application. We've also got Dr. Eskew in our department. Uh, he's a nutrigenomics person, but uh, he's been exploring uh, brewing industry, craft brewing uh, quality, uh, you know, basically working to enhance and apply yeast genomics to sort of predict craft brewing quality uh, traits in uh, new beers and designing beers to sort of with intent versus random guesswork. This is something that we're hopefully going to be able to sort of apply uh, to uh, food fermentations uh, and some of the protein work that we're doing with uh, pulse crops as well and to maybe engage Dr. Eskew and other work. We've also got Dr. Vishnu Acharya, Martin Rainey, Vladimir Vujanovic and Dr. Zhao Q in our department. And they also do work that uh, sort of spans uh, to varying degrees the kinds of works that we've heard about, talked about today. You know, value-added bioproducts, valorization, uh, Dr. Q looking at omega fatty acids uh, and uh, expressing those in different microorganisms or even plants. And so this gives us some capability. And Dr. I should say Dr. Vujanovic uh, being an expert in uh, biological control agents, and he also does uh, fermentative work from time to time. Um, the first, the facility, so while our faculty all do varying degrees of this kind of work in their own labs, everybody's more or less got their own space, but we also have a fermentation facility, sort of a dedicated level one space. It's got a biosafety cabinet and uh, areas for handling microorganisms, transferring microorganisms and sort of initial growth. Uh, media prep, uh, it's adjacent to our autoclaves and a cleanup space. Uh, we've got anaerobic chambers and minus 80 storage capacity as well. In that facility, we've got solid state and submerged fermenters of varying sizes. Uh, but basically, we're talking about sort of lab scale and, uh, and not the uh, scale up that we uh, will hopefully be sort of in sequence with at the food center. The other thing that we offer at the university is we've got these, uh, you know, we've got a lot of capacity for doing sort of basic science where people are interested in understanding a little bit more about what they're trying to achieve in terms of maybe the molecular biology and the genetics of organisms and gene expression, analytical uh, characterization of what kind of metabolites are being produced. Uh, and, and in that regard, and maybe a little out of sequence, we've got the Structural Sciences Center and then the, you know, the only synchrotron in Canada, the Canadian Light Source which has like 22 different beam lines that we can apply to different types of analyses that we might wanna do. But the other piece is that we have uh, on campus and off campus with some of our uh, you know, uh, facilities operated by our partners, uh, the facility in, and the capacity to do animal trials. So it's one thing to be able to sort of do work and to uh, predict that we're going to achieve certain functional traits and, uh, and uh, effects on the material that we're fermenting. But quite often, if we're talking about nutritional effects or anti-nutritional, you know, elimination of anti-nutritional factors, we uh, need to do animal trials uh, so that we, you know, beyond having just characterized amino acid uh, profiles and, and so forth of proteins, we need to do animal trials. And so we have the ability to do small animal, uh, birds and piglets uh, at Prairie Swine Center, for example, either on or off campus or with our partners, even in the government of Canada. 
these are uh, just, you know, so our submerged fermentation capability, here's some pictures of some things going on. Uh, 100 to mil to 15 mil. I mean, these are just stirred reactors here. And here we've got sort of an older, um, larger version of this, except the ability to do some control over fermentation conditions. And these are some uh, 15 liter bioreactors here with some uh, higher capabilities uh, that can allow us to get up to, you know, a good size scale. I, and also I would just, uh, you know, emphasize that often we, before we move to this scale, we often do sort of highly uh, replicated in terms of technical and biological replicates. We do the kinds of things that we need to do to make sure that we've got statistical uh, validity in the, the things that we're observing. And then we move up in terms of scale. Uh, the solid state fermentation, these are basically just uh, temperature, humidity controlled incubators, uh, and we can get up to 10 kilograms in size in these. Uh, just a couple of options and things that we've already heard uh, Dr. Karki talk about uh, gave some really good uh, uh, input on sort of the things that you think about and what's going on in terms of when we work with the, you know these different types of systems and ferment different things. Uh, as I mentioned, we're we're typically using ferment uh, fermentation to improve the performance properties of our flowers and or fractions, whether they're starch or protein fractions. Um, you know, okay, minor point, but it's not always true fermentation, which would uh, be an anaerobic process. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we do or that we often do doesn't really require fermentation, uh, only that some amount of growth that is typically aerobic going on and the secretion of some sort of hydrolytic proteases or whatever kind of enzymes that are gonna be cutting up the substrates. Uh, and so a true fermentation, obviously an anaerobic process uh, and, uh, and, you know, with sort of definitions that I won't go into, but at the end of the day we use, and I, it's, a pro, it's a pretty broad term that gets used. And so anything that goes on in one of the reactors that I showed you is generally considered to be a fermentation, at least for the simplest simplicity of it. And of course, what do we control? Well, again, I'd say, uh, uh, Dr. Karki talked about the kinds of things that we control. Uh, we can certainly control the organisms that we add if we're using fungi or if we're using bacteria, uh, you know, the concentration or the density of the inoculum, we can control the, you know, the temperature, the pH, and if it's something like a submerged or solid state fermentation, we can control the water activity in the, the uh, blend material that we're working with. Uh, and so to that effect, you know, in submerged fermentation, the advantages and disadvantages of the two, again, I would say she covered that nicely. I won't say much, except that, you know, you go with what works best. Sometimes, um, uh, you know, the simplicity of solid state fermentation is hard to overlook. And the fact that you don't have so much water to deal with, which would, you know, require a fair bit of dewatering and, and downstream processing versus submerged fermentation and the ability to have much tighter control over the diffusion and uh, distribution of substrates and, you know, everything's, it's basically swimming around in a sort of a, uh, a soup that would be homogeneously stirred. You get a lot of site specific stuff going on in solid state fermentation. Uh, a point that I think may get overlooked a lot is that we often have indigenous microflora that are present in a lot of these materials. They're not sterile. A lot of these fractions or flowers uh, and there's, uh, you know, there's been a lot of conversation lately about, you know, you've heard don't eat cookie dough because you might, you know, get E. coli uh, foodborne illness or something with, you know, there's been cases of that that's gone on. And so any kind of insecure, um, you know, from farm to fork handling, uh, we often see that there's sort of uh, contamination of the materials. Well, just to say that a lot of indigenous flora exists and need to be considered uh, that could interact with the inoculum. We look at these kinds of things from time to time. And of course, the prox, you know, the performance indices, you know, the characterization of the major proximate uh, uh, characteristics of what is, you know, before and after fermentation, for example, are functional attributes in terms of, you know, we're interested in uh, basically enhancing some of the things like the performance of ingredients. And so if we're interested in gelation or foaming capacity or oil and water holding capacities, you know, we're obviously going to be doing a suite of those types of tests. 
and uh, and of course getting enough material. Uh, and this, of course, sometimes requires that we scale up a little bit or a lot even to conduct a meaningful animal feeding trial. And uh, and so uh, these are some of the options. And and it's a small small thumbnail sketch, I guess, of uh, what really needs to be done. But these are the kinds of things that we think about. This is again, uh, you know, a little bit of what uh, Dr. Karki said, um, but you know, I'll just step back. And of course, traditional fermentations are things that have been uh, developed through trial and error over often hundreds of years to give us these great food products that we know and we like. And uh, and uh, and so, soy sauces and uh, cheeses and things have uh, extremely well defined characteristics now. But it did take a lot of trial and error. And, and her point to the, the fact that we need to basically deal with every kind of application. You know, every time we move from one pulse crop to another, or a, a concentrate versus an isolate versus, you know, uh, um, you know, something where we have an application where we're interested, more interested in gelation. We need to really go through the characterization steps, and especially where we switch organisms. We need to go through this all again. And, uh, and this is very time consuming. I mean, we don't have hundreds of years of trial and error to devote to this. And so one of the, the hopes is that we can, you know, maybe it's not precision fermentation per se, but moving towards more precise fermentation so that we can uh, speed up that, uh, that period of time and that background information that we need to collect so that we can advance things to the next scale more quickly. Uh, so what is our role then in this ecosystem project? Now, uh, you know, we are contributing and, and as uh, evidenced by my appearing here right now, uh, you know, providing webinars and also then there will be a short series uh, you know, of workshops to help uh, train HQP uh, from small medium enterprises to enhance their skills and knowledge with respect to uh, different types of fermentation systems and the types of options that exist for their incorporating that into their uh, production scheme. Of course, we work with the Food Center. Uh, we have a, a very long history of uh, work together with the Food Center. And uh, of course, you know, a lot of collaborative projects have gone on. Um, we are generally flexible at the university to the extent that uh, our uh, managers will allow us to be with respect to IP arrangements. So usually permissive, permissive type uh, arrangements. Uh, joint funding opportunities exist uh, to basically cover the cost of what goes on. Uh, and in collaboration with ADF, PIC, HANSERC, there's all kinds of options there. And, uh, and generally speaking, these are inexpensive relative to just going. Um, you know, and our role is to do these pre-commercialization research to sort of help avoid pitfalls as you try to jump too far too soon. Uh, and so we play that, uh, you know, that first first level uh, a bit of science before moving to the next level of scale up. Basic and advanced training to students, PDF staffs, employees, uh, access to state of the art instruments and infrastructure, and of course, the dissemination of knowledge to which, to the extent of which we um, have pre agreed arrangements as to how to handle uh, information. So that's all I've got for you today. Uh, Happy to address any questions. Here's our contact information. I guess the questions are at the end. Thanks, folks. Um, thank you, Darren. With the next uh, presentation, I'd like to invite Dr. Karen Churchill to talk about uh, the role of Agwest Bio in the project. Thank you. Thanks, Mehmet. I'll buy us back a little bit of time. That paper, that paper, we'll just throw that away. So I'm speaking to you today as the CEO of AgWest Bio and as the director of the Global Agri-Food Advancement Partnership. So for those of you who have not heard of GAP, it is a partnership between the Global Institute for Food Security, AgWest Bio, the Food Center, Innovation Place, and private industry partners. And our tagline, is innovation is a team sport. And we truly believe that partnerships are key to growth. And that's why we are so excited to be part of this project, the Advancing Fermentation Processing in Western Canada. So each of the project contributors um, will leverage their unique strengths to build more than we can as individuals. 
Egg West Bio will be providing event delivery. So we'll host more events like this one. We hope you can continue to join us at them, um, as well as other supports. We will be helping to fully understand the current capacity and opportunities in the fermentation ecosystem. And the GAP will also take that ecosystem support one step further to provide tangible programs, which includes investments, training, mentorship, expertise, to help commercialize early stage companies and rapid growth companies. So for those of you who haven't actually seen the GAP, please contact one of us. We'd be happy to give you a tour because the GAP is unique in North America. It is a hybrid venture capital and soft landing facility. And so we have the flexibility to outfit office space, laboratory space and greenhouses so that you can tailor it to make your company more successful in its startup journey. And I have to also give a small shout out um, to the Saskatoon Food and Ingredient Processing Cluster who will be hosting their meeting after this one because they're part of that really supportive ecosystem that will make us become stronger as a whole. And as the Saskatoon, I can't do their acronym, SVIPC, Saskatoon Food and Ingredient Processing Cluster. It's a group of businesses in this area who actually all share the same vision as we do in this room, that if we help each other, we will actually all grow as a team and help put Saskatchewan and the prairies on the map. And these factors will really propel us to be world-renowned player in the fermentation sector as well as delivering that economic growth to Canada that the innovation supercluster programs were intended to do. So I really actually wanna really thank everyone in this room and the CEOs that will be attending at the next meeting and the strategic discussion group that will be attending after this as well, because it's having that kind of commitment and that ability to work together that helps us punch above our weight as Darren had said. So thank you again. Thank you, Karen. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, go through the overall contribution of the Saskatchewan uh, Food Industry Development Center. But before doing that, uh, I really need to recognize a person here, uh, Mr. Dan Prefontaine. Uh, he was our former president. I don't see him now. I think he left or yeah, I think he left. He was here earlier, uh, thanks to his vision and the overall uh, uh, the overall, the progress that he showed at the food center, the overall organization came really a long way since 1997, coming all the way to uh, this time. And I'm the new president of the organization, but uh, it's really, I wish he was here, just had a chance to see some of the, the work and the overall presentation here. So food center has been established in 1997 as a uh, basically commercialization arm, a pilot plant, and an organization for the industry. Uh, over the past 25 years, it's grown from 10,000 square feet over 70,000 square feet, mainly on the local crop meat utilization, plant-based foods, and ingredients. We have over 55 FTE, we total about over 70 people working at the center. We have two locations, one in campus, other one is Schuler Street. So overall, really, the overall goal and the vision and the mission of the organization to lead the evolution of Saskatchewan's agri-food industry and to provide the leadership, expertise, and the services for the agri-food industry. And when we look at the overall strategic goals of the organization, driving the growth of the agri-food industry, drive innovation, maximize the impact of the center, build the awareness and capacity, and support the agri-food industry initiatives, and to provide the business attraction and job impact for the province. So when we look at our technical and outreach programs, primarily product development, pulse utilization, ingredient innovation, processing incubation, extrusion R&D, manufacturing, and as well as the food safety. And now there are new programs coming in 2022-23, primarily on the fermentation technologies, mainly on conventional, industrial biotechnology and stellar agriculture, sustainable food ingredient technologies, food grade crop quality, as well as sustainability and the life cycle analysis program. So what's the overall vision of the project? Again, I really need to acknowledge Dan, Karen, Megan, the entire uh, partners here, because I've been here three months as the president and the more I learn about the project, uh, 
it really goes back the entire uh, the agri-food processing industry and the fractionation industry. If you look at only what's happening in Saskatchewan in terms of the pulse processing, there are so many plants and there are so many plants being built at the moment. So there will be a lot of not only the protein production, but there will be a lot of starch and the fiber and so many cold streams coming from these plants. And when we look at the canola crushing capacity, we have four plants and there are five more plants coming on the way in the next three to five years. So we're going to be looking at a significant amount of canola meal, starch, and so many different byproducts. So the vision really to support the growing agri-food processing and fractionation industry by increasing the value of core products, cold streams with fermentation science, technology, and the commercialization. So when we look at the overall objectives, to the major objectives is to develop an ecosystem together with the partners, which identifies the fermentation companies, support the infrastructure, industry suppliers, technical and educational support for their industry, to attract the expertise in the field to Western Canada to support developing a pilot processing and scale up facility focused on food and ingredient products, and to provide technical support to the industry to provide commercialization scale up services and increase the success of startup companies. So the overall organization, when we have the pilot plant, the fermentation center of excellence established, is going to be from lab to pilot to production scale process development, and the process modeling will be available. And in addition, additional objectives are to promote the use of Western Canadian plant-based products and co-product streams from the commodity ingredient processing for the use in fermentation. These are primarily canola meal, starch fiber, and the co-products to build this whole collaboration and the partnership environment for this whole ecosystem and to support the training and education in fermentation to augment the industry growth. So we really need the experts here in Saskatoon or around the region to bring more expertise to work around this whole ecosystem. So some of the deliverables of the project is hiring the new staff, senior fermentation scientists, process engineer, microbiologist. This has been written for three to four people now, but we are in the process of bringing probably four to six. So we got a, a program facilitator. We have a new junior scientist and other junior scientists coming in June. We hired the principal scientist on fermentation and other scientists coming end of uh, June and looking for the program manager as well. So we'll be looking at five to six people. And uh, with that, uh, mainly work on the development of the fermentation ecosystem map, conducting two fermentation related webinars, one in the fall and one workshop and the constructing of the sole state of the art pilot plant by Q4 22, 2022. And we are going to be looking for six major new clients for the fermentation facility by May 1st, 2023. And support the training and development of the pipeline of new fermentation expertise. So with that, the fermentation center of excellence is the, the really exciting part. We'll be able to support the industry for commercialization, commercialization scale from 1.5 to 15,000 liter. So anybody who can come from a small bench tub with one to two liter or three to five liter, then they'll be able to go up to 15,000 liter submerged and about three to 500 kilogram in this uh, solid state fermentation space. So we'll be able to provide a large amount of uh, production capability and the overall process will be supported with the necessary downstream equipment to refine or purify the ingredients for commercial use and this all the pilot fermentation facility and the downstream processing requirements for the companies so that they can commercialize the technologies or the products that they develop. And this is kind of the high level, uh, uh, the map of the overall fermentation center of excellence. So we'll have two labs here and two major um, incubators. So the companies, they can come here, one large, one small, that uh, will be able to utilize the space for their commercialization or startup activities. And the main key focus areas on the collaboration, education and entrepreneurship this overall place is going to serve as the commercialization arm for the fermentation ecosystem to lead the training and technology transfer programs with the industry experts, equipment suppliers, and technical experts with all the program partners and to deliver web-based and specialized hands-on training to industry institutions and the private firms. So some of the extension strategy will be will be working on several informational material packages, webinars, presentations, 
to support overall long-term goals. And the whole idea is really to bring the several companies here with that whole developing uh, agri-food uh, processing industry, especially on the pulses and oil seeds. Again, I'd like to acknowledge all the partners for success. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes. So I try to do as fa fast forward as possible. Uh, and we have 10 minutes for the questions. I like to open that last 10 minutes uh, for the questions for our panelists, our keynote speakers, and also the program partners. Amy, do we have any questions on the online participants? Test. There we go. Um, we do have one question here. I'm not too sure who it was for specifically, but it was, how do you control growth of other microbes in your fermentation media as it's suitable for other available microbes with meal? Um, that might have been... Vishnu? Is Vishnu available? Or, or maybe Darren? Yeah, Vishnu is no longer on. Darren, would you like to talk about that? I can take a shot at that. Um, you know, it, it all depends. Uh, quite often, we're inoculating with a high concentration of our organism of interest. And so you can, you know, if you've got a small amount of background flora, then usually they're not going to be, you know, major contributors to the final product, basically. But you can run into circumstances where you have problems. Uh, and, you know, there, there could be options in terms of, you know, if you're using an organism that might be, well, I, I'd be speculating as to the best ways to do this. We, we haven't, you know, we've only recently been, uh, you know, sort of examining this, but I, I believe that, you know, you could try some mild pretreatments, for example, infra, infrared technologies and things to knock down the concentration of the organisms if they turned out to be problematic. Okay. Thank you, Darren. We have a question from the audience. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I have a question for Dr. Kerr. So I noticed that in the treatment of your soybean product, you chose a hexane free product. And I'm wondering, I could ask two questions. Uh, why and what, else, what is the method that you are using? OK, um, good question. Um, <clears throat> The um, uh, there, there are two reasons. One was um, <clears throat> consumer back uh, or customer back to the product quality. We have some um, customers, particularly in the Scandinavian uh, aquaculture space, who demand non genetically <clears throat> modified uh, protein ingredients for their aquaculture uh, uh, feeds. And because of the relative size of uh, genetically modified versus non-genetically modified uh, soybean production, <clears throat> it has uh, been difficult to uh, establish non-GM soybean supply chains except under uh, specialty processing um, you know, conditions because a lot of the smaller scale expeller facilities are uniquely suited for um, you know, these types of special uh, supply chains. <clears throat> Most of the traditional solvent extraction, uh, uh, desolventizer toaster facilities that uh, dominate the oil seed industry uh, find it very difficult to do identity preservation type campaigns, whereas the expeller facilities do. And, and so that was, that was one reason. We, uh, we intentionally designed our facility uh, in South Dakota so that it could actually handle uh, both, both uh, GM and non-GM <clears throat> expeller and solvent extracted raw materials. And you could preserve the identity, you know, throughout the separate uh, sequential campaigns. Um, we have some customers who literally uh, are ambivalent <clears throat> about whether or not the the raw material supply and the ingredient that comes to them is genetically modified or non-genetically modified. So that was the that was the driving force behind the 
the uh, use of that particular raw material coming into our fermentation process. And we, to this day, we, we, we do both. Thank you, Phil. Okay. We have another question online here for um, Phil. And it is, the first question is, um, the fermentation you employ, is it solid state fermentation or submer submerged fermentation? And then there is a follow-up question asking, if it is submerged fermentation, how much of meal is included in each batch as a carbon or nitrogen source, if it's the only source of carbon and nitrogen? Yeah, so it's an aerobic submerged fermentation uh, process. <clears throat> Areobacidium poliolens is the is the uh, production host of specific strain of that uh, species. <clears throat> um, the solids that comes into our particular facility uh, uh, governs a lot of uh, viscoelastic properties that are critical um, in the uh, flow of materials throughout the process, and that's typically around um, uh, on a on a uh, liquid volume uh, basis about eight to nine percent and and so our our fermenters are relatively large um, you know fifty thousand gallon uh, uh, total capacity and nominally we operate them at four, about forty thousand um, and in those particular materials, in those particular vessels, uh, again, the solids is uh, in that eight, uh, eight to nine percent typically. Thank you, Phil. So, you know, hopefully that answers the follow-on question. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. You actually offer the food center. Would we say the food center is ready to take uh, fermentation processes? And would they accept all types of fermentation? Are they ready to go large scale or to fill the plan in place? Uh, we, are in, we are right now building the facility. So uh, the, the overall, uh, some of the auxiliary buildings, they are being built. And the breaking ground of the building will be happening in May, late May. So the building will be ready by December this year. So by probably quarter one, 2023, we'll be able to take the, the projects, especially the large projects, uh, in our place. I mean, at the moment, we can take uh, some lab bench or more like a lab scale activities, but again, that can be with partnership with CAP or University of Saskatchewan, so different type of uh, smaller systems. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Heidi, yes. I have a question for Phil, or anyone can answer, but it's probably more targeted at Phil. Where do you see the fermentation process that you're using in terms of carbon intensity and emissions? Um, about uh, 10, nine to 10% of the total carbon incoming the facility today is not captured and reconverted uh, into other forms through uh, uh, CO2 that's that's created during the fermentation process. Um, we're, we're watching closely uh, carbon capture uh, technologies that are that are being investigated in um, uh, the, the biofuels uh, uh, industry in, in particular. Um, for, for us right now, our primary uh, focus in terms of total um, system uh, valorization, uh, because again, we're a zero effluent uh, uh, facility, is this um, syrup stream that's, that's uh, generated uh, uh, as the fermentation process uh, proceeds. Um, so we are, <clears throat> we are in the final stages of, uh, uh, of our own life cycle analysis, including all the way back to the uh, beginning of our uh, supply chain that I showed you on the video and, and in the presentations. And uh, we should be publishing that here, we think uh, in the next uh, four to six months, depending on uh, several factors that, that uh, need, to, need to take place. So that'll be available. Um, you can always you know, reach out if you're interested in, in that type of information for a facility of our size and our type. And we'd be happy to share that type of information with you. I summarize, um, you're not carbon neutral now, 
And in order to become carbon neutral, you're saying you have to go after uh, carbon capture. Is that correct? Yep. For zero, uh, if we want to be carbon neutral, the CO2 capture is going to have to be part of that uh, ultimate strategy. So, sorry, let me one more question. Go ahead, please. Uh, so, what would you say to someone coming online building a fermentation facility? You know, what advice would you give them in terms of their carbon emissions or how to tackle that? Or other than sitting and watching and waiting, do you have any insight into it? Well, you have to recognize if, if it is, a, in our case, <clears throat> it's an aerobic uh, uh, fermentation. And, and if that's key to the uh, production of the products that are, that are in demand, and, and for our case it is, um, then you have to recognize that's part of the metabolism of uh, the production host. And therefore, then you have to realize it's going to take <clears throat> and, uh, that type of awareness and that type of uh, uh, technology strategy if you want to be, you know, zero water, zero product effluent, and zero uh, CO2 effluent as well, too. Thank you, Phil. With that, again, I'd like to thank uh, all our speakers, uh, keynote speakers, and the program partners. Uh, we very much appreciate all uh, your participation and presentations. And again, thank you so much for all the participants. We look forward to having you in our June uh, session as well as in the fall webinar. Thank you again. Yep. Thank you, Mehmet. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Phil. Bye. <clears throat>